Welcome to App Talk with Uptick, where we dig into the nitty gritty of how to grow apps and games. We speak with industry experts about specific strategies, tools, and tactics they use to find success, and we keep you up to date with emerging news and trends in the ever-changing games, marketing, and technology ecosystem. My name is Xander Agosta, Director of Marketing here at Uptick, and joining me today are my co-host... Warren Woodward, co-founder of Uptick. And our guest... Justin Vogel, uh, co-founder of Safari. Nice. Thank you for joining us, Justin. Very excited to have you. Um, for a little context about how I know about you, Warren basically hit me up on uh, Slack one day and was like, hey, I found people besides us who are doing Web3 growth and aren't terrible at it. And so <laughs> that, that, that's uh, that's uh, why we decided to get you on the pod is because um, that, through that connection. Yeah. That's yes, awesome and, here. Uh, really excited to uh, dig more into you know what you're building with Safari and your, your vision for Web3 growth. Yeah, cool. looking forward to diving in. Not too many people of us are, are talking about Web3 growth at this stage. And uh, yeah, glad that there are other people that are really excited about what the future of Web3 growth looks like. Yes, lots of people talking about uh, Web3 numbers going down the last few weeks, <laughs> but uh, less conversations about growth. So it should be fun. Cool. Um, so our first section is Industry Insights, where we do a deep dive on mobile industry news. We have a reasonable number of articles this week, uh, four, I believe. And so we'll dig right in. Uh, the first article is entitled, is a GamesIndustry.biz article entitled Diablo gets over 24 million in spending within 14 days after launch. The title says the most of it, but basically uh, if we sort of just dig into the numbers a little bit more granularly, one thing to call out is it's, it's a pretty even split between iOS and Android, about 13 million on iOS, 11 million on Android, 43% uh, of revenue came from the US, 23% came from North Korea, or sorry, South Korea, um, which is pretty interesting and I think it shows who the audience what audience really resonates with this game and the key key part is that it's not out in China yet so I think they really they're basically soft launching it in the west and I really imagine the majority of this uh that overall revenue will probably come from China but we'll have to wait and see um a couple other key notes uh just under seven million downloads overall so uh you know not gangbusters but not to nothing to sneeze at and with 24 million in spending this makes it the second most high revenue mobile game for Blizzard after Hearthstone. So have either of you got a chance to play Diablo? I mean, what do you think about these these numbers? I personally haven't had a chance to, to play Diablo, but uh, I was also really curious and interested on the 20, 20 plus percent coming from South Korea. Um, I think that we're seeing this with both Web3 communities and gaming communities as well as more geographic focuses um, and also in like very intentional strategies dedicated toward getting certain types of populations um, to be playing their their games and joining their NFT collections and so on and so forth. So yeah, interesting trend I'm seeing from my end as well. Yeah, I'd love to dig into those Korea numbers a little bit more. Um, so uh, some, some may know my former role was uh, executive director of user acquisition for Nexon M, which was a mobile branch of Nexon. And this is really not surprising at all. I mean, when you think about relative to population, those numbers might seem crazy that you have, you know, over 50% of the you know, American market revenue, US market revenue rather in uh, South Korea. Um, but the thing is there's, there's a few traits to Diablo Immortal that make it a very natural fit for that market. Um, in South Korean culture for years now, and, and, you know, this is where Nexon did and still makes a lot of their revenue. Uh, there's a lot more, hardcore mid midcore like console style gaming happening on phones this there's a kind of a confluence of events there there's like higher end average devices um more people are able to play on fast internet connections and it's just like we see that more like hardcore action rpg or you know, strategy games are a little more mass market there you'll see them like you know marketed on the subways and marketed like movies so i think that 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 market was a lot more primed for something like this. Um, I worked on a game a few years back called Darkness Rises, which just felt like, wow, it, it felt a lot like a Diablo for, for mobile um, and kind of made me hungry and curious for when there actually was a Diablo for mobile, how it would do. So I think that that audience is already used to these kind of economies, these types of yeah. gameplay patterns on mobile and just, uh, it's a natural fit. I think, I think you sort of called it out at the end there, which is like, I think that's an audience that's really, really primed for free to play in these types of games. Whereas like there was a huge amount of Western backlash against the game um, because right. of the free to play economics, which, you know, I mean, there are tons of free to play games, but I think the audience skews a little bit, I don't want to say like hardcore, but against the traditional like action RPG, um, 
genre. And so I think that there's just there's games like Maple Story were huge in Korea. And I think that, you know, which is a free to play slash pay to win economy. And so I think that this is a, there's a very natural progression of games that are monetizing very well um, in those in that economy. So it makes a lot yeah. of sense to me. I mean, on, on that note, when we took uh, Maple Story M, which was a mobile version of Maple Story, it's hugely successful in South Korea, other Asian markets, and we tried to launch it in the US, it just was not sticky. It just did not work there, despite like how proven it was in these other markets. Makes sense. Yeah. And then the, one, just one other point here is like it was developed in um, developed with NetEase. I'm sorry, Double Mortal was developed with NetEase, which is a Chinese company very known for their free to pay games. And so it seems really obvious that this is a they went with NetEase because of their familiarity with the Eastern market. OK, moving on. Yeah, up next, uh, we wanted to touch on this. Uh, we're going to reference the, the PocketGamer.biz article, but really what they're covering is a McKinsey and Company report. Uh, about the metaverse. So um, the, the headline is McKinsey and Company Report predicts 5 trillion in metaverse earnings by 2030. Uh, McKinsey and Company's report predicts that by 2030, up to 5 trillion will be generated. Between 2 trillion and 2.6 trillion of this is expected to come from e commerce in the metaverse. Uh, and I pulled a couple of stats uh, from another paragraph that seemed interesting relative to kind of like the you know, generational affinity for metaverse. Uh, from the sample of Gen Z participants, 87% stated in the survey that they were engaged in gaming. Meanwhile, fitness and shopping were found to be popular with millennials. Furthermore, a survey of US consumers also found roughly 70% of consumers from Gen Z to Gen X rated digital identities as somewhat important or very important. So yeah, two, two things kind of stood out about those, those numbers. One is just that uh, you know 87% of Gen Z is gaming. Like that's, I think, unprecedented. Um, and it's just you know, further confirmation of gaming as mainstream, mainstream entertainment in the, the biggest capacity you know, for, for this generation. Um, what was more surprising to me was the concept of digital identities and how um, widely accepted that is even from older generations back to, back to Gen X. So you know, the, the, this report references kind of that we're in the proto metaverse stage right now, which I think, you know, Xander, I know at least you and I would be likely to agree with. But um, Justin, we'd love to go to you here maybe to start. I mean, there's, I'd say, you know, we, we know of the tangential relationship between metaverse and Web3. It's not like you know, one is a requisite for the other. We see with things like, like Rec Room and, and Roblox. But just what are your thoughts on these kind of revenue expectations and the, the timeline for uh, mass adoption? Yeah, I think it sounds quite reasonable to me. And I think that there are other parts of the article too that, that were interesting in terms of thinking about uh, how the metaverse can create a creator focused economy uh, rather than just like these like larger gatekeepers. And I also think that that's very in line with what we see from Gen Zers too, is like this world in which there's a lot of uh, creators and maybe virtual influencers uh, that are sort of the, the drivers of this, this open metaverse rather than big tech game companies big tech companies of however they are, however they look. Um, but I do think that we'll see uh, teams competing too as like with virtual influencers, as like brand identities in, in the metaverse. And so I think that that really changes to this notion of digital identity, both for you, me, the three of us having a digital identity, but also having digital identities that are run by brands as more people-like um, avatars. So I think there's a, a lot to come in terms of how we think about identity in the metaverse, both on an individual level and on a brand level. That's a really interesting point. I think we'll probably dig more into that in the main section when we start talking about different um, tactics for Web3 growth. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a lot of strong opinions about this article. I think the main thing to think about is, just, you know, they're saying 5 trillion and then they're defining it in some sort of like arbitrary way. Like these are things are metaverses and these things aren't metaverses. You know, it's, it's hard. I mean, when I think about what the biggest metaverse is currently, in my opinion, and uh, it's Facebook. And I don't mean like the meta quest. I mean, like Facebook blue and Instagram. Like, I think that is basically a metaverse is people creating a digital identity for themselves and living on it, putting a lot of social cachet in it. So, you know, it, it, will we be at 5 trillion in 10 years? Sure. I don't know. Maybe it sort of depends on how you define it. <laughs> so that's, those are my thoughts here. Cool. Um, this next one is an interesting one. Uh, I've been trying to do it justice. It's, it's sort of a complicated issue, and uh, there's a few big pull quotes. But this is article. This is actually news that came out last week. We sort of missed it because we had so much news. Um, but there are two articles here which are interrelated. And I want to talk about them. Uh, 
interesting moral issues that come up pretty quickly here. So the first one is a Venture Beat article entitled Saudi Arabia's Savvy Gaming Group uh, em Embraces Embracer with uh, $1 billion investment. So I'm going to first just read this news article talking really quickly about um, this piece. And then there's a rebuttal from the CEO entitled CEO comments on the announcement of the direct share issue to Savvy Gaming Group. And basically there was so much backlash about this article, or sorry, about the fact they took a billion dollars that they had to respond. And I just wanted to sort of hit, hit on the key points of that response and talk about it a little bit, because I think it is a really interesting uh, case study in what's going on in the world of gaming as we speak. Okay, so the first article, uh, Saudi Arabia's Savvy Gaming Group embraces Embracer with $1 billion investment. Here's a small quote. Savvy Gaming Group, an investment group from Saudi Arabia, has invested deeply into Embracer Group for $1 billion from the Saudi Arabia Public Investment Fund. Embracer shared out $99.9 .9 million in B shares. This allotment equals 8.1% stake in the Swedish game video game and media holding company. So just a couple other notes. The Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia Public Investment Fund has $620 billion under management. That's a big number. All right. So the Embracer Group is a Swedish video game and media holding company. Uh, they've employed a capital-heavy inorganic growth strategy, rolling up game and media properties under one roof. They have some of the biggest brands in gaming, including Gearbox Entertainment, Coffee Stain Studio, THQ Nordic, and more. We covered them. We covered this on one of our episodes before we went to break, Warren, where they bought up Tomb Raider, uh, Squ uh, Deus Ex, Thief and a few other have these really big brands for like $2.5 billion the same uh, same week that other deeds went out for like and so raised $4 billion. And we were kind of laughing about the comparing and contrasting that there. So that's that's the first piece this investment was made. There was some backlash because obviously Saudi Arabia doesn't have a great uh, public image. Um, so just to read about the response from the CEO, um, it's a long article. I'll link to it, but here's some, I'll, it gets a few quotes. I want to be clear. Embracer will continue to be operated by me, our operative CEOs, and management team across the entire group. Embracer is built on the principles of freedom, inclusion, humanity, and openness. The transaction with SGG will not change that in any way. Embracer is still controlled by people working on the group. Together, we control a significant percentage, uh, sorry, significant, significant majority of the votes in the company. SGG will now own more than 5% of the votes and 8% of the capital which they've invested. Embrace... But they've invested in Bracer because they support our current vision, strategy, leadership, and not to change it. Here's where it gets interesting. We've now built a unique platform for entrepreneurs like no other industry peer. This expansion has required capital, and we have been able to raise approximately $2.5 billion since our IPO in 2016. In order to stay as an independent company in Sweden, we have been searching for more, for more international long-term partners with capital that supports our strategy. There are only a handful of players in the world providing this type of sizable long-term equity capital. Without capital, our journey will notably slow going forward, which could have many other implications for our business. Okay, what does that mean? They've been growing by inorganic growth, and it's been the entire, entire existence of the company. And they're, you know, they're kind of playing musical chairs. If at some point they stop growing inorganically, they're going to get hammered by the market. And so, I mean, it, obviously they're, they're stuck between a lock and a hard place. They need money. And there's only a few people left in the world who are able to cut the checks the size that they need. Um, there's a, a little bit more here, which is um, they said, we've learned and discussed difficult topics, including non-gaming issues relating to Saudi Arabia. I truly, I truly believe in inclusion and change that can be affected by opening our content to new markets. So this is a little bit of like a double speak, but I think the interesting thing is he's basically saying, uh, you know, we're taking the money and I think we can we can use that to affect the ability of the sovereign wealth funds, which seems kind of crazy. But here's there's like a last piece here, which is they bought this is a it's a public trading company, you can go buy the stock. They decided instead of the sovereign wealth fund or the savvy game group representing representing the sovereign wealth fund, decided instead of going to public buy it on the public market, they did a, a preferential offer directly to uh to Embracer Group, where they overpaid for stock. So they paid more than the market value for stock on the public market. Why would you do that? I mean, the only reason I could think of it is to buy influence. Okay, so I guess that's sort of a lot. I have opinions here, but I'm very curious to go to you guys to, to what you think about this overall and what it says about the market. Yeah, this, this, this is interesting. I'm gonna, you know, I try to couch my opinions unless I feel like I have something to, to really add. Like, you know, we have, we have friends that are part of Embracer Group. We've worked on games that have been acquired by Embracer Group. Um, I have strong personal opinions about some of the actions of the Saudi government, which I will not uh, put into our podcast about games and Web3. Um, but for me, I think the neutral thing that I can touch on here is that when we start having 
governments um, investing more aggressively and owning more of our entertainment companies. Um, I think in general, despite your opinions on the Saudi government, like that's that's a slippery slope that I'm not a, a big fan of. Um, and I can understand why, you know, there's pushback from probably from their employees, from share, other shareholders, I would imagine. Um, the optics of it are not great for Embracer, to be blunt. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that's my high level thoughts on it. And it, for the price over market, about about how much over market price do you do you know, know, Sander? I don't actually I didn't actually do that math. Um, yeah, I mean it kind of reminds me of like how the the uh, potential Twitter deal was was structured. Yeah, it's a little bit different because in the Twitter deal, it's a takeover, so you have to get the mm -hmm. you have to do the premium so that they will do it. Where this is right. it's still a public company, they only own five eight percent of it or whatever, five percent of it. Yeah, so. good point. Justin, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, definitely a complicated one from a lot of different uh, standpoints. And uh, they also talk in the, the article too of, I guess, like one of the less controversial but potentially interesting points that I read was talking about how there are more gamers in MENA than in uh, Europe or the US. I Super personally didn't, didn't know that, but that was yeah potentially extremely interesting to think about um, Embracer Group seeing this as a potential way to gain more market share in the Middle East or North Africa. So that, I don't know whether that's like a convenient um, narrative or whether that's like actually like a, a big strategic decision for them. Well, yeah. that's a trend I've, I've heard for a while. And it's nothing that, we, you know, we've never worked on a game. I think that's focused specifically on Mina uh, more and less correct me if I'm wrong, but it is something that's always been a, you know, a component of the strategy. I mean, without veering too deeply into politics i mean i think it's easy to say you know we as we don't support authoritarian regimes or as they called it what they call it, they call it non-democratic regimes in their in their uh in their coverage of it but i think i think it's a little more more complicated than that right there's not uh you know Amer america is not like bloodless on their hands and so it's really fun for us to stay back and say we're you know we're democracy we're sitting in a nice cap in a free market economy um but at the end of the day, they took the money because they needed it. And if we're, if we're yeah. truly believing a, of a capitalistic system, then like, I mean, who? It, it's kind of, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you argue against this. I mean, it's a, right. it's a probably it's, trade company. They can just go buy the stock. You can't stop them. No, I mean, I think that's probably, you know, the, the most important part of this story is it sounds like they needed to do that raise. You know, they've been growing at such a pace and it's been primarily through, through M&A, um, you know, in these kind of market conditions. They probably didn't have a ton of uh, options for how they raise the sum of that amount. I mean, they, the, the CEO basically uh, alludes to that. So they, they, you know, this might be a deal that they wouldn't have structured uh, a year ago. You know, with the same partner or partners. Yeah, and I think there's a quite like there's a the other interesting piece about this might be interesting and in how we can fold it into like Web three and how decentralized game economies are are potential alternative to centralized game economies where you have to take a hundred or sorry, a billion dollars from people that you might not want to take money from. So I guess I'll just sort of, unless we have any other thoughts here, I'm just going to sort of bridge to our main section. We're going to be talking about the web three growth playbook. Does anyone else have uh, any, any thoughts on this before we move on? Let's Great. do it. Cool. So um, this is a section on web three growth. Uh, as we have said several times, we have our guest, Justin Vogel. Um, so please, Justin, tell us a bit about yourself, your background. What is Safari and what do you do there? Yeah, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been doing growth at Silicon Valley tech companies for the last four years, um, doing all sorts of different types of growth. Started at my first company doing community building and product management, uh, then went over to Winolo, which is a Series D staffing company marketplace, um, where I was doing acquisition at the top of the funnel, uh, ops led growth in the middle of the funnel for onboarding and then doing experimentation platforms uh, at the, the bottom of the funnel. So um, done a little bit of everything, pretty uh, yeah, full stack in uh, my growth experience. And last summer I started getting the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial itch to start my own company. Um, and so left last fall, uh, found myself in, in Web3 shortly thereafter. Um, and one of the things that we found when we were trying to start our, our first Web3 company was Web3 distribution strategy and growth was, was very different than what we had to, what we're used to in Web2, especially on the B2B side. Um, and so we started, um, I just started talking to all these different Web3 growth leaders, uh, hearing more about what they were doing, what they're seeing, 
uh, exchanging tactics with them, doing so on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And it just became very clear to me that there needed to be, uh, that we needed to organize these Web3 growth leaders in, in a way that there wasn't before. So we created the first uh, community of Web3 growth leaders, that's Safari. Um, and now we have community leaders and growth leaders from around 250 different Web3 projects. Um, so our mission together is to, to build the Web3 growth playbook. Uh, we believe that Web3 growth is definitely at a, a point where it's not zero sum. And so we need to be working together and sharing what works in real time to evangelize Web3 as an ecosystem. So we see Safari as onboarding and teaching the next generation of, of Web3 growth leaders to build longer term network driven growth strategies that we believe will bring the masses to Web3. And uh, thanks for that, Justin. Just just to chime in here with some personal anecdotes. So I I learned about, I don't even remember how Safari first popped on my radar. Um, it was in the early stages, but I kind of jumped at it because, you know, as a team here at Uptick that's been working on Web3 growth, it kind of feels like you're, you know, in, in a desert sometime, uh, sometimes being able to have actual thoughtful, intelligent conversations. I mean, for a few reasons, like there's still a lot of stigma against so much of Web3 in a lot of, I'd say the uh, growth communities that we're also part of. Um, it's still, you know, especially in a bear market like this, it can still be the laughing stock at times, not get the same amount of thoughtful discourse and respect. Um, but it's also just so new. And I've really enjoyed my experience in Safari so far, um, just because everyone tends to come in there very humble um, with the, the idea that we're all learning together super low egos, non-existent. And, um, you know, another thing that I'd say is kind of unique about Safari is born of Web3. Like this is actually the first time that I've seen Justin's face or known his real name. You know, we all have our digital identities uh, in that group. And I've had um, really cool conversations with people that I've met in that group that have, you know, broken off into side conversations or continued relationships that I'll find out down the line are like C-levels or founders of super large companies that like kind of blow my mind, but there's something really cool about um, us all figuring this out together, starting from the same place, kind of regardless of who you are and um, the digital identities uh, being separate from, you know, who we are in our day jobs really, I think enhances that in some cool ways in Safari. Yeah, I think that we're, we're really just starting to explore and get to the tip of the iceberg on a lot of these, what these Web3 strategies look like. and. We were also, I was learning this when I was talking one-on-one -on -one with many growth leaders when in January, right before we started Safari was, you know, a lot of people are, you know, what's unique about Web3 is many Web3 growth leaders are doing growth alone at their company. It's right. not like what we see in Web2 where you're like part of a 50 to 100 person growth organization. You have lots of different roles. Like a lot of Web3 growth leaders were feeling lonely and unsure about themselves of whether they were doing the right thing. The pace is moving so quickly. Um, that they, you know, really saw Safari as a lifeline to talk to other growth leaders, get sort of that sanity check, like, okay, yeah, you're doing this, you're seeing this, cool, like, I'm on the right track, and I think building their confidence as well as, as leaders of tomorrow Web3. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I want to sort of go to the core of the problem here. So I saw a couple of these questions from your website, from the Safari website. Um, but let's just start sort of at the beginning. What are the foundational challenges of growing Web3 apps compared to Web2 apps? And, you know, you have, a, I think, a list that we can talk through. Yeah. So the four that we tend to think about that growth leaders uh, face in either one or multiple ways is the first one is identity. So in Web3, the vast majority of on-chain activity is pseudonymous. And also, as Warren was mentioning, right, like within the Safari community, we interact as our digital identities and selves. Um, so when I see our community members, I personally know, you know, who they are in a more meaningful way since they, since Safari is a closed community and people apply into it and share some things. But uh, there are interesting that if you're like a, a larger community, you might not know uh, much more than the username or what. Uh, contextually is in your discord about your your community members. Um, so that's one challenge that a lot of Web3 leaders face. Um, the second is a fragmented user experience. So um, one of the really interesting things about what have we seen in a lot of Web3 products is that you know, in Web2, you have your first party application, like your, your app, your mobile app. Um, and then you have all these third party ad platforms and social media platforms. And you're essentially trying to get like all this, 
you're just trying to direct attention from all these third party platforms at your first party app. But in, in Web3, it's a little different. Like the, the funnel is a lot of a lot of Web3 products don't have a first party application right. um, at all. So their funnel looks like Twitter engage their audience, like Twitter's their new landing page. Discord is like their middle of the funnel. That's when they're engaging their users. Um, and then the bottom of the funnel is on-chain revenue transactions. And so when you're, you're there's like a different experience when your user flow is, is cross-platform and and not owned uh, versus when it you're trying to direct ads and attention at a first party platform that you you fully own. Um, so that's the second big one. Uh, the third one's communication. Web3 native communication channels uh, for like email push notifications, text, um, and even ads as mentioned are like still very, very nascent in Web3. Um, so that's sort of starting to work itself out. Some companies are trying to do more like Web3 native communications. Um, others are doing like less of that and still relying on email, but I think that they're still like, it's still early days for what Web3 communication platforms will look like. Um, so people are using a combination of tools that aren't quite nearly as effective as um, the Web2 ones that we have at our disposal. Um, and the fourth is platform limits. So, you know, most Web3 products are constrained to the 30 million crypto wallet holders. Um, you know, I guess a great example for, for Uptick is, you know, technically mobile is a platform constraint um, that if you're building a mobile app, you, you're only limited to all the mobile users. Um, but obviously you don't really think about that as being a constraint since there are so many mobile users out there in the world today. Um, but that's sort of a, another just tangible aspect of, you know, we're in the, the early mobile days of Web3, like, situation so there it is actually a, a real intangible constraint that to be limited to wallet holders yeah, yeah. No, for, for us like digging as we've you know digged through the space like particularly the last the last year or so it really does feel like there's new challenges and to some degree starting from scratch in so many parts of the the growth marketing funnel um and you see this reflected in the common tactics uh which i think we're going to go into in a bit here but um what i've seen from so many projects is just sort of a reversion to like the utmost basics of well we can't really we don't really know how to measure stuff and we don't have like really robust set of tools we don't really have a lot of references of you know okay exactly this worked so kind of reversion to like brand style marketing of just blast things by by the the you know the virtual or in, in some cases like we've seen how many projects like get the Times square billboard you know and it's it's kind of ironic that in this you know this the most emerging, arguably the most exciting, like emerging medium, we're just kind of back to the stone ages with at least, you know, how we're doing a lot of marketing tactics in these, these early days. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say real quickly, like it's, it is interesting. We see the same as, you know, these challenges, the four of them make it really hard to re-instrument the web two funnel and right. to user level targeting. Um, but I think that that also provides new opportunities for Web3 companies, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into um, as the, the segment moves on. Yeah, I mean, I do want to dig into what the levers are for what are the, because there are some basically net new levers that Web3 marketers have for, for growth. And I think those are really exciting, but I, I kind of want to hover on the current topic a little bit further. So, I mean, I would, I think, just like to dig into each of the different, the different pieces of this challenge and talk about what are the pieces are, how are we able to address them so far? So, I mean, like starting with identity, I mean, we talked about basically this uh, level of pseudonymity in the majority of Web3 projects. How, are, how have, I guess, Justin first, but I'm sure Warren has some thoughts here as well. How are we thinking about how to use identity in, in the Web3 ecosystem for as a growth lever? I mean, are we just saying, hey, yeah, I guess that's the, that's the question. Yeah, I think that it's, so I think that the interesting thing, the combination here is, you know, if we're not doing, if we're not recreating user level targeting in the short term, so user level targeting uh, is very identity based, then what? Um, and so I think that more and more, I'm sure we'll talk about community in a bit, um, is thinking about users in aggregate. Right. Um, so it's less so about that specific Justin Xander Warren identity and more so thinking about how to drive collective decisions and collective purchasing decisions via group dynamics rather than just an individual purchasing decisions. So I think that 
identity is maybe on the, the individual level is becoming less important. Um, and so more so thinking about collective identities um, and collective purchases. That's, Justin, yeah. on, on the other end of the spectrum, um, as the space evolves, do you anticipate that we'll start seeing walleted addresses sort of mimicking some of the identifiers um, and you know, providing, providing a means to some targeting that looks and feels a lot like traditional like user level targeting? Yeah, I believe so. I think that where I'm very bullish that Web3 data will change the way that companies grow um, from having this having data that Web2 marketers never had in, in Web3, um, or that, sorry, the Web3 marketers never had in Web2. Um, and so I, I, yeah, I think that a very, very key um, growth lever for Web3 marketers will be Web3 data via wallets. Um, and happy to dive into my thoughts on on that, but there are many of them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty wild. Like to be, be be able to build an ideal customer profile. I mean, you have all the customer data. Assuming, I mean, assuming it's one wallet, there'll probably be ways down the line to link multiple wallets to a single physical human. And so, I mean, the ability I'm to gonna, identify I'm talk whales. Talk about one today, actually. <laughs> great. Oh yeah, you are. I forgot about that. Okay, great. We'll get to it. Well, so okay, we'll 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 get move on to community as we talk about growth levers. But I do want to talk about communication. So, you talked about communication as being somewhat. The, the channels are different and talk about some of the challenges there. Are there advantages to the new, the new communication uh, methodology that we're using? Advantages. Well, I mean, it's like, what I mean, is advantages is one way to think about it. It's like different. So I guess if it's not advantages, how, how are, how are the differences impacting how you think about growth in Web3? I guess is another way to frame the question. Yeah, I think that it actually is an advantage, but many people might not see it as such yet. Um, like, the way that email SMS push notifications are, are structured, they're structured as a one-to-many um, communication channels. And so that's very um, you know, representative of how we do web two marketing today. And so I think that even though like Discord and Telegram are like not optimal yet for uh, community building and other things, like I think they um, do provide a new way for us to have a more direct relationship between brands and customers and also customers and customers facilitated by a brand. Um, and so I think that, yeah, the, the nascency of these communication channels, I think is, is good because it's a experiment for what I think will actually be the future of marketing. Yeah. One thing that's, that's really shifted on the communication side is just sort of the, the power dynamics. Um, and Justin, you're just alluding to some of this, but uh, the relationship between, you know, customer and, and, business or project is, is really changing. Like I gave this anecdote before, but like uh, early on when we started working with uh, the Sky Mavis team for, for Axie Infinity, um, they brought us in to do an, an AMA, uh, a, a Twitter space with their community. And, um, you know, we've been, uh, I've been working in games for a long time, as has the team here. And that's the first time uh, that, you know, basically the marketing and ads team would be brought in front of like the, you know, the, the, the customer base. Um, and the kind of the level of questions and thoughtfulness to them it was much more like you were taking like an investor meeting. Um, so it, it's definitely a very interesting uh, that just the levels of transparency are very different, and the, that that power dynamic feels very different in, in Web three. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Like I feel like you know Web three growth leaders and marketers are are kind of used to being behind the curtain um, and doing things. Um, you know doing a lot to like customer persona research and other things, but not necessarily talking as directly to um, their, their end users. Right. And so I think that this is a really cool opportunity too for how you know, product and growth might come more together and marketing um, to have very, you know, their own direct uh, relationships with customers that inform the work that they do. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so let's talk about the fragmented UX. That's a big is a big challenge. I mean, in some ways it's good because it's like a breaking apart of the vice grip that the old ecosystem, I mean, predominantly the platforms had on how user funnels, uh, you know, how, how growth works and how user funnels are thought about. So I, let's just like sort of just talk about that. What are the, what is the fragment of the UX and the fact that now the web three user journey is split across all these different uh, platforms and mediums. What does that mean for how we think about growth? Yeah, I think that the, the big thing that's changed in my mind is that, you know, the web two funnel is, is linear, like, you know, we all know what that looks like. 
Um, but the fragmented UX means that you are kind of engaging and meeting your customers in different channels at different points of the, their user journey, which is, I think, a lot more complicated. Like yeah. um, you have Discord and Discord is a place where both um, you have pre-purchase customers and, and post-purchase customers, uh, both engaging with each other as well. Um, and that creates very interesting new dynamics for, for what growth and marketers need to consider. Um, so I think that that's both like a good thing and a bad thing, right? Like, you know, in the past when you owned your own real estate, you'd have like customer testimonials on your website and, you know, the, you know, new pre-purchase customers kind of just have to trust that that's like legit. Right. Yeah. Um, but now there's an interesting factor of, right? Like there are live testimonial like opportunities for your pre and post customers to interact in a way that is organic and feels very real um so that that i think will create lots of different interesting opportunities and dynamics in the future it's, it's really good for someone who has a really plugged in happy community it's yeah. really dangerous for someone who even like even a Obviously, if you're being exploitative to your community, you're going to get wrecked. But there's also a weird medium where you can have a team that is really genuine, really cares about their communities, working really hard. But if something goes wrong and the pitchforks turn on them, it becomes very scary to be on the back half of that where you're like, oh, crap, you know, these people have put my whole life into trying to make these people happy. And now all of a sudden they're not happy. And I don't know what to do about that, even though I'm good intentioned. I mean, obviously, they're so that's like the sort of the danger and benefit of the mob. <laughs> Cool. Um, we talk about platform constraints. I think it sort of ties into the fragmented UX idea, but is there any other anything else that you want to touch on in terms of platform constraints and how that evolves our, our thinking? Yeah, I would just say that like, you know, obviously we're in a we're very early still within web three. And so these like 30 million crypto wallet users will definitely grow. But I think this also connects to the the web three data pieces as that as the platform constraints lessen there's going to be very, very interesting new opportunities for how Web3 growth leaders are using data and Web3 data in a way that they weren't able to use Web2 data. Makes sense. Cool. Well, let's work on to, let's move on to the next segment where we're going to talk about what are some of the native growth levers to Web3 that give Web3 marketers a distinct advantage over Web2 marketers. So do you want to talk a little bit about what those different components are? Yeah. So the two that come to mind, and we've alluded to both of them, are, are community and data. Um, and so community is obviously not a Web3 native uh, channel. However, I think it's, it's definitely been popularized by Web3 companies. And I think that the reason for why communities are so important um, is there are a few different things, right? This will be very common knowledge and uh, for a lot of your listeners, I'm sure. But you know, the Web2 marketing strategies that we've been using for many, many years are, are saturating. Um, and they're becoming increasingly inefficient. Um, and so that sort of needs, as we we're mentioning, like a, a potential hard reset of rethinking the way they were doing Web2 marketing, um, I think creates a lot of opportunities. And so, you know, as reaching customers online becomes increasingly expensive, product differentiation and customer attention have become more important than ever. And I believe that communities can help with both of those things. Um, so we've seen, I feel like, many examples of community-led growth strategies and experiments in Web3, from giving customers real ownership to leveraging old social media channels like Discord and Telegram in these new ways, to building products more directly with customers and for customers. Communities are enabling brands to create a more direct and bi-directional bi relationship with their customers in a way that um, hasn't, I feel like, we haven't truly seen before. Uh, Web Web2 promised uh, that we would be able to use all this data, like we're mining all this personal data on you so that we can give you like a more personalized relationship with our, our brands and through ads and other things. And I feel like that promise was not exactly fulfilled no, as we mined all this data, but it didn't become more personalized per se. Um, so, but, I, but what is personalized is a personal relationship, right? Um, and so I think that that's a really interesting, unique um, unique uh, part of Web3 of, you know, less so about, you know, whether you believe in Web3 or not as a marketer, I think you should be very closely studying what Web3 growth leaders are doing in these communities, because I think that it, even if the, the Web3 experiment uh, goes down, which I don't think it, it will at this point in time, like, 
I very much believe that community life growth will be the future of growth, at least in the years to come. Yeah, I can definitely say for our site here at Uptick, we had to, you know, when we decided we were going to get serious about Web3 growth, we had to take a very honest look at the playbook that we use for Web2 and and be frank with ourselves. Like, does this even make sense? You know, like we're, it, it would be very easy for us to just try to shoehorn that in. Like we, the scale of, of business that we do in Web2 and, and mobile, but we, just thinking critically about the space and uh, this ties to like the thing we we're just talking about on platform constraints. You know, we have at this point, Web3 is still a very enfranchised, uh, very, tight knit communities full of early adopters. Um, and when we looked at our own strategies, we basically say like, hey, ads are not like a primary lever here. It doesn't matter if we can bring 50 million players in a year for our web two games, that doesn't work for this, this audience. So we had to really go and rethink this and it's still like a work in progress, but like our first offering that we rolled out was almost entirely community driven. It's just essentially like we rebuilt it as a partnerships model where you know the community for the game developer we represent we try to get a list of like high affinity communities that we think will also find value in that project, reach out to them personally, try to add value by offering them, you know, everything from like AMAs with the founders of you know, our games to actually like, uh, you know, integrating assets or kind of paying tribute to, to that community and assets of the games that we're working on. And it's super interesting. It's, it's a lot, um, in, some, in some ways it's a lot less scalable uh, than, than a lot of what mobile and, and, and web two marketing is. Um, but it's also like super engaging and a lot more fun and, and, and personal. Yeah. yeah. Go for it, Sander. Well, I was just going to say, I wanted to, you, you touched on a couple of tactics specifically, and I sort of wanted to dig into those. I mean, you, you talked about two of the things that we've sort of had on the list to talk about that you touched on are like, you know, airdrops and integrations as like core levers that are unique innovations that we can give to web three marketers as tools. Do you want to touch on, you know, sort of how, what those are for our audience who may not, not, might not know. And then for the audience that does know, you know, how are we, what's the best way to use those most effectively? Yeah. So for, for those that don't know, airdrops are um, when a community gives uh, its native token or can also be NFTs to their community as an incentive mechanism, either to have them join the product and bring awareness to it or to use them to incentivize them to continue to engage with the product. Um, and then integrations is um, what you expect it to be in the Web2 world as well, but in a world that's a little bit more permissionless, uh, people can actually create integrations uh, between companies without even talking to them. Um, so they can just fork their, their code and uh, add a, they call it like Lego building in, in Web3 of like, taking one project's code and adding it to theirs to make a sort of like super app. Um, but I think that like at the baseline of all of these things is Web3 data. So as promised, we'll talk a little bit about that and how that then leads back to uh, airdrops and these other things is, you know, Web3 creates unprecedented transparency. Um, company revenue, users, customers, transactions are all public for the first time. And so this data is now open, it's composable, it's compounding, and anyone can capture the value of this data. So this is a big shift from the, the web to walled garden mindset where you had all these big, big companies creating their own data sets and then you know, keeping that away from the private eye um, versus you know, now growth leaders have access to data that they never had in web two. For, for example, they can look at their customers' past purchases and even how much money is in their wallet today. And so we've seen a lot of early examples, especially in late 2021 of web, how Web3 data can be used by growth lever leaders to drive really impressive growth. Um, so one of the, the great examples was um, LooksRare deployed what's called a vampire attack on OpenSea. Um, so LooksRare is a, an NFT marketplace that got started in um, I believe, yeah, like January, February, 2022. Um, and OpenSea is the, the market leader. Um, so what Luxor did is they looked at all of the um, OpenSea customers, which are fully public on the blockchain right. um, and said, hey, we're going to give all these people, anyone who has ever made a transaction on, on OpenSea, some of our, our Lux token to incentivize them to, to one, bring awareness to our project and two, to try and incentivize their OpenSea's strongest and most loyal customers away from their platform. 
Um, and so LooksRare was able to drive around 19 billion in transactions within two months of launching, which is like completely unheard of. It's yeah. just absolutely insane. And so I think that, you know, in a world where customer data and metrics too are, are publicly available, new growth strategies will, will inevitably deployed, be deployed. So, you know, some examples is, you know, if you know how much your potential customers are paying your competitors for crypto native SaaS tools, you can try and to incentivize them away with discounted prices. Right. Like right now, there's so there's actually a huge lack of transparency in the B2B like tooling space within right. Web2 is like all sorts of different companies are paying like, you know, their tool for their tools, like different contract amounts. And like, you don't really know like uh, right. how much each person is, is paying. And so that's a great like Web2 advantage. But, you know, in the Web3 native context, like, you know, you'll be able to see, hey, you know, these people are paying uptick this amount. We're gonna, you know, try and incentivize them away with lower prices or whatever that looks like. Um, and then, you know, another way and another tactical way that you can use Web3 Web data is if you look at all your customers' past purchases, you can see all the different projects and communities that they're, they're potentially a part of and create partnerships with those projects um, in a data-driven way that you might not have been able to do. Like you might not know that um, all of your, um, you know, different players are playing. Um, what was the thing we were talking about before? Diablo Immortal or other Web3 yeah. games. Um, you might just have a, a mini community of those things and you might never know it until you look at the, the Web3 data. Um, and, you know, another two is like, you know, in a world in which uh, metrics are public, like we see this a lot on Dune and there will be certainly other others that come up in the future. Um, you can really benchmark your progress against the market um, in a way that you wouldn't be able to understand in, in Web3. Web to today of to be able to say like here's what you know monthly active users looks like on chain for all the gaming industry and now I know you know what whether I'm on track or not and I can go to my executives and say like hey we don't need to like go to Bloomberg to buy like all this fancy like data from all these different data companies we can just look on chain right. and say you know this is the the average for monthly active users and like this is how we're doing against that. Yeah, it's, it's really mind blowing just what this level of transparency that's available to us in Web3, the doors that that opens. I mean, like imagine being, you know, reference Nexon again, like say you're putting out a, a new game and you could just have, uh, you, know, you, you want Netmarble's data or, you know, whatever competitor, you just, just wouldn't it be nice if we could had all of the data on the biggest spenders in this type of product? Okay, yeah, here it is. You don't have to like, you know, do espionage to get it. It's all publicly available. And then, uh, creating an incentive for those group of people. Um, there's so much that we're going to be able to do uh, that that it feels like it's not even like the tip of the iceberg with how mature the tools are uh, relative to the the level of data that's available. Yeah. Okay. So we are getting close to time. So I did kind of wanted to pivot to some particular examples. So I guess Justin, what what are examples of some of the projects that you can point to as leaders in the web three growth space. So who are the, who, what are projects that are doing an amazing job? You just referenced one, the vampire attack, which I think is fascinating. Are there other examples that are like really, really impressive web three growth strategies that any uh, web three marketer should take a look and go, okay, I, I need to pay attention to this. Yeah. I think that, you know, looks rare is an interesting one. Uh, step say, say that obviously, one more time? Sorry. Say, looks rare that with the vampire, air, 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 air. the airdrop vampire attack that they used. Um, Stepin's obviously a very interesting one as well. Um, but I think that we're also at a transitionary moment in Web3 growth. Um, a lot of the sub people that, that joined, so I guess to scroll back slightly, I feel like there have been two waves of, of Web3 growth. Um, first wave, which we very much saw in like the end of 2021 um, and probably all of 2021 was really about a lot of these short-term uh, hype-driven um, growth strategies that, that created very short-term companies and outcomes as well. And I feel like over the last six months in particular, a lot of Web2 growth leaders have entered the space thinking much more long-term saying, you know, we saw this play out in Web2, incentives only last for so long, we need to be thinking about long-term sustainable, durable strategies. And so that creates slower growth, but it creates more sustainable long-term outcomes. And so I think that we're, we're starting to see this shift today of more companies are adopting 
uh, slower moving but more sustainable growth strategies. And so I think that we're still the early days of, of that, but probably in the, in the coming months, we'll really be able to see what the, the positive outcomes of those projects are, especially as, you know, in a bear market, there will be a lot of people are down, but those who are up and continue to rise from building sustainable long-term strategies today, um, those will be the, the really interesting projects that I think we'll be studying in, in the, the years to come. Yeah, that's, that's well put. This this first phase of Web3 growth was so speculation-based and it fed into a lot of these negative stereotypes that still really kind of poison the space and keep a lot of good people out. And one thing that we've seen recently in the space is, you know, speaking to short-sightedness, is companies whose primary revenue model was selling NF N NFT set, you know, with some amount of like lifetime benefits. And then they get six months into building their MMO or whatever that was supposed to fund. And it's like, there's not really any more money coming in. Uh, you know, they're making like incremental marketplace fees, but that that in and of itself is dependent on your community, you know, not wanting to hold their assets anymore. Um, so we've seen a lot of those companies just scramble, you know, put out, a, a, well, here's another collection, no, another collection, um, but it's not a sustainable strategy. So I think, yeah, the, the version of, sustainable projects that we're going to see in a couple of years again look very different from what we saw in the last you know two years yeah cool um well before we move on to our last section justin is there anything else you want to touch about touch on on this topic or you know the whole the playbook in large yeah um one thing that i think that web3 marketers in particular should be thinking about today is i don't know how much awareness you two might have about china china's private traffic um so Private traffic in China is essentially uh, looks a lot what, like what Discord community marketing looks like today in Web3, but at scale. Um, and so it's a basically privately owned communication channels that Chinese brands have with direct directly with their, their customers. And um, it gave rise to it in China in around 2019 uh, for very similar reasons that at Web3 community building has, has happened today. Um, and I think that this is a perfect example and something that a lot of Web3 growth marketers should have on their, their radar of, you know, I believe private traffic is what community-led growth that we've been seeing in Web3 looks like at scale. Um, so like an example is like, there's a, a Chinese brand called Perfect Diary that has 5 million different um, private traffic users and they've been generating around 80 million just from private traffic. Um, so it's they it's a lot of the different things that we're starting to see in, in Web3 growth of virtual influencers, having more like direct relationships with customers. So that's a brand creating an identity that then that identity interacts with actual users um, and can do so at scale because they can have lots of different people operating that identity behind the scenes. Um, and so these examples, yeah, just give us a, an early look of where I believe that this world is is going of, uh, yeah, community-like growth at scale. Yeah, that's interesting. Give you some homework. I'm going to go do some research on that. <laughs> Maybe talk about it on the show next week. Great. Um, well, thank you for that one. Super, super fascinating topic. Really glad we could have you on to talk about this. Um, we will move on to our last section, which is app of the week. Warren, do you have an app this week? Yeah, I have the perfect app for this week. So uh, the app that I am talking about this week is ChainPass. So what's ChainPass? So for anyone watching on YouTube, this is ChainPass. It's basically like- <laughs> That's not working. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's not working very well. Anyway, it's, it's a QR code um, basically. Uh, but 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 what is, what is it actually? So this is, uh, I mentioned I was gonna speak to something that kind of merges uh, physical identities with digital identities. And I think this is a cool, simple example of that. So um, with ChainPass, you essentially connect any number of uh, you know, wallet addresses that you own that you want to associate with your real world identity. And then it's essentially created, you can use it for token gated events in real life. So both uh, Justin and myself are headed to New York this week for NFT.NYC. And there's a number of events that I'll be going to where the reason that I'm allowed in them is because of a digital identity or digital object that I that I own. And you know the, the way it's enacted is with this app ChainPass. So you know it has uh, you can connect uh, any wallet you want. And then if you want to go to an event and it's hosted by a private community that requires ownership of an NFT, they would just scan 
you were chain pass and deduce if you were authorized to be there. So it's, it's I think, a simple but um, good sort of explainer use case of, of merging digital identities with physical identities. Cool. Justin, do you have an app this week? Yeah, my app is Feedly, uh, Web2 content aggregation app. Um, it is, I learned about Feedly about six months ago, and it has been, it's like one of my all time favorite apps now. Um, is that I'd use it to curate, uh, sign up for a bunch of newsletters, curate them into different topics, um, and just learn. So, like for me personally, I have like all crypto VC newsletters in one topic, I have all the like interesting Web3 thought leaders, uh, all their newsletters in another one, um, all the just like general crypto uh, news in, in a third. Um, and I just use that to curate all of the, the things that I, I learn about and stay on top of things because I think that, yeah, signing up for newsletters and having them appear in your, your email is a very limiting um, limiting way to, to get newsletter content. And I think that what people are writing about in their newsletters is some of the, the best output that I've been able to find. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, my, I just get blown up with stuff in my my email, so maybe I'll check what check in on this and see if I can find a way to, to better synthesize the data. Yeah, super cool. Uh, Xander, did you bring an app this week? I did. We actually sort of talked about my app at the beginning. So my app this week is one people have probably heard of, which is OpenSea. OpenSea is a marketplace for NFTs, uh, primarily Ethereum, but they just lost Solana uh, project uh, Solana. NFTs as well. So the reason why this is my app, obviously something we know about is because um, I, over the previous week, have been a net buyer of NFTs, which has not been my position over the previous six months. I've been very, very critical of most of the crypto ecosystem. And now that we are seeing these crypto winter and people are yelling and screaming, their hair is burning off. I'm like, okay, this is the time to get in. Two reasons. One, because all the stupid money that was just chasing short-term alpha is sort of been flushed out of the ecosystem. And number two is now like, you know, I think the prices are low. Entry points are reasonable. And the people who are still here are actually thinking about this in the right way, you know, are here to build and actually have interesting projects and are, you know, being really thoughtful and clever about the way and thoughtful and creative, clever, and, you know, about the way that they're thinking about the Web3 ecosystem. So, um, you know, I've, I've had some NFTs in the past, about a few, but now I'm like, I'm kind of, this is the time I think you should get into Web3. If you haven't really, you know, I've, I've been tangentially related for a while, but I think it's a really interesting time to actually say, hey, you know, a lot of the dumb money is flushed out. Like if you're serious about that, if you're interested in it, there's no there's no better time to get in than right now. And so that's why I got OpenSea because you can, that's why I apps OpenSea. So. That's it. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for coming on with us. Really, really insightful and interesting. If someone wants to get a hold of you, how can they do that? Uh, best way to get a hold of me is to follow me on Twitter. So that's uh, J K E Y underscore E T H um, is my handle. Um, and you can also learn more about Safari at uh, Safari, which is with a Y dot club. Safari dot club. Great. Awesome. Warren, will you take us out? Absolutely. So thanks so much for coming on, Justin. Uh, this was, uh, I think, I think this was the most kind of thoughtful and all encompassing episode we've got to do so far in the web through growth space and no better person to speak to it than you. So really excited to see, uh, you know, where the future of Safari grows and just how the space evolves overall. As always, the episode this week is brought to you by our team here at Uptick. So here at Uptick, we help games and apps grow, both traditional web two, uh, but obviously we've got a big focus on web three lately as well. And uh, I'll just say, you know, one of the things I'm most excited about is some of the, the tech that we're gonna be putting out in the next year related to utilizing some of this unique data uh, that we touched on in this episode in the Web3 space that we're already finding the hints of um, really cool stuff that you can do uh, to leverage that data for effective marketing in ways you couldn't in Web2. So stay tuned for some uh, upcoming product announcements for us in the next uh, six to 12 months, depending on how development goes. But uh, I think it's going to be a very innovative time for uh, for all of us that do this type of growth marketing. Awesome. Talk soon. <laughs>